here. You guys know that she's leaving for a little while. She'll come back. She'll always come back. You'll come back. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hard. If you th Once you get a taste of Hawaii, it'll be a little bit hard. So tell us, Esther, where are you going? Honolulu. And when do you leave? Three days. And how long are you going for? Three months. And what are you going to do there? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so um, for those of you who don't know, YWAM is a missionary kind of organization, and they train missionaries and send them out to third world countries, Asia, all over the world. So um, I'm going to be working on the base that trains those people, and I'm just going to be volunteering and serving and being a staff, and that's basically it. Nothing too exciting, but... Whatever they ask you to do, you will do it. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so we're... We're really proud of Esther, but, we, but even though she's going there to work and volunteer, this is mission. And this is what we do at LifeBridge, what we should be doing as Christians, is we're always on mission. This is a step forward for her, and we want to just take a moment as a church and pray for her. So I'm going to ask the elders to come up and join me here, and we're just going to kind of commission her off on her little mission, whether it be three months or longer. And uh, maybe I'll just ask Wayne if he'll pray for his daughter. And we'll join together with, with everyone, and we'll just join us in praying for Professor and her mission journey. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you for uh, my daughter, Esther, and uh, she's been an inspiration for me. And, and uh, just pray that you would bless her and uh, just, just uh, guide her and direct her as uh, she uh, just uh, walks by faith, and uh, she wants to do your will. And I just pray that you would continue to guide her and direct her and... Um, just give her a good time and uh, there when she's working and uh, just draw continuity drawing to you, Lord, as she grows in her walk. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Proud of you, Esther. All right. Just before we start, let's ask God to uh, open our minds and hearts as we dedicate this time to him. Father, we're so grateful we can be here. We pray for those who are not able to be here and that you would just uh, find, allow them to have some time with you this morning also. We ask that you will speak through the words that you've helped um, Rob prepare this week, that you will give him some good stories that will resonate with our hearts, um, that you will uh, also be with Gordon and Anna this morning in the mission work they're trying to do in Honduras, uh, that you would provide the needs that they need so that they can represent uh, you in all that they're doing. Pray for Lindsay, who's off in Nepal, that you would provide with her with um, wisdom, uh, with protection and safety, and that your Holy Spirit and angels will be with her and her team, and that they will have a lot of impact in what they're doing there. Father, we're grateful that we're here and we're gathered as a family. We just ask that you will teach us something about yourself this morning, and that we will draw closer to you. And we ask for your blessing on our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Well, <laughs> I don't know about you, but um, I find those chairs really uncomfortable. So I, I brought my own, because I actually like to be comfortable. I, I, I really don't like discomfort. and So I, I typically try to avoid discomfort uh, whenever possible. Uh, and, and you know, it, you know it, it's warm, it's cozy here. This bizarre looking chair um, sits in our bedroom right by the, the baseboard heater. And on those cold winter days when our house just wouldn't seem to heat up downstairs, I would just go upstairs, put a blanket over me, put my feet on the heater with my laptop on my lap, and, and that's where I'd write most of my sermons. And so, you know, this is, this is to me, is, is comfort. And, and, but it, it sort of depicts what I would like my life to be. I'd like my life to be comfortable. I, I, I don't like the stuff that comes in and sort of pokes and prods at your life. And so, as I, as I think about, about life in general, and I look over there at the cross, you know, that's not comfortable. Can you imagine hanging on that thing? I mean, we can't, actually. It is, it's so beyond our realm of comfort that we can't even begin to grasp the suffering that would be associated with that. Because that, that's pain. That is not convenient. 
And, and, and it's, it's kind of mystifying, though, that, that Jesus would actually say in Matthew 16, 24, when he's talking to his disciples, he says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And then he goes on in, in 10, verse 38, he says, and if anyone does not take up his cross and follow me, he is not worthy of me. And, and really? I, I mean, I thought, like, when I come to Christ, life is supposed to be good. Life is supposed to be comfortable. Life, it, 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 it's the way it's supposed to be, right? So what's with this whole pickup here? Your cross? What was, what was Jesus thinking? Like, doesn't Jesus want me to be happy? Doesn't Jesus want you to be happy? Does, doesn't he want you to, to, to be free from all the things that would want to bog you down in life? Doesn't he, doesn't he just want you to be comfortable? Like, like, what's going on with this whole cross thing? And, and you know, I want to walk with Jesus. I, I, I really do. But I want to walk with Jesus as long as he doesn't go somewhere that is uncomfortable. I don't want to necessarily, I, I, I want to hang with Jesus. I want to do life with Jesus as long as he stays within my realm of comfortableness. That, that sort of, that, that realm of safety. The, the, the place where I can be smiling and just be happy. So, you know, what I, I, I'm comfortable doing then is saying, Jesus, you know, I, I want to hang with you. I, I want to chill with you. But so when you're done doing that over there, why don't you just grab your little seat and pull it up to mine and, and the two of us can just be comfortable together and hang together. Isn't that sort of how we want Christianity to be? I want to stay here. And I just want Jesus to pull up his chair beside me and we'll have some great chats together. Hmm. You know, we're going to talk about this whole issue of comfort today. Because what I've noticed in my life is that Jesus very seldom pulls up the comfortable chair and sits next to me. He's constantly over there doing cross-type stuff. Hmm. Shelley Buett has uh, had an experience in these past uh, two weeks. Uh, like her, 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 her mother passed away, and, and Shelley had the opportunity to share at, at her uh, mother's funeral. And um, I'm just going to have Shelley come and share because that was definitely not a comfortable experience. So, Shelly, why don't you come? There we go. Okay. Good morning, folks. Um, as most of you know, and as Rob just mentioned, my mom passed away two weeks ago this morning. And since Rob's sermon today is all about comfort, I want to start off by thanking all of you who comforted Norm and I in our loss, whether it's through cards, email, Facebook messages, hugs, prayers, etc., whatever it was. Some of you even traveled all the way down for either the visitation or the funeral itself. Regardless of how you comforted us, Norm and I are very grateful for your support. There is definitely a time for comfort, and that is one of them. There is a time, however, to step outside your comfort zone. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. Most of you who know me know that I prefer to remain in the background doing th things behind the scenes or with minimal visibility. However, this past year, God has been prodding me to do things I normally wouldn't do. Things like leading a community group and being part of the worship team here at LifeBridge. When I met with Rob the other week um, to do my network consult, I decided to try out for the worship team. I figured I'd go to practices for at, least month a month, month, for at least a month or so, just gradually getting comfortable with the idea of being up here in front of everybody. But God and Julie, thanks Julie, had other plans and had me up here the following Sunday, which just happened to be the very Sunday that my mom passed away. Reflecting back, I think it was God's plan all along for me to be up here worshiping him as, he, as mom was leaving this earth to be with him. I've taken great comfort in this belief, and I have had an unimaginable sense of peace over her passing. As it turns out, however, God didn't want me to be too comfortable. A few days after Mom's passing, I woke up in the middle of the night with all these thoughts going around and around in my head. No matter what I did, I couldn't make them stop. So I finally got up and started writing things down. I was feeling a compelling urge to share the gospel with everyone at the funeral. 
the day before, one of my sisters had asked me to do a reading at the service. I was given three choices and had narrowed it down to two. After talking it over with her, she said that Proverbs chapter 31, verses 10 to 31, which is entitled The Wife of Noble Character, was more in line with the rest of the service, so we decided on that. It was the next night that I woke up with all these thoughts going around in my head. I was really nervous about speaking, but felt it was something I had to do. I wasn't sure how it would go over with the rest of my family or with the minister who was conducting the service, so I said nothing to any of them, as I didn't want anyone or anything to prevent me from being obedient to God's leading. Sorry. <clears throat> I figured it would be easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. Somebody else already told, told me that as well, but we won't mention any names. <laughs> um, if it came down to that, so that's what I went with. And when, when it came to my turn to speak, my legs were shaking so bad, kind of like they are right now, that I wasn't sure I could remain standing. However, I'm told that regardless of how I felt inside, my voice didn't reflect my nervousness and my message came out clearly. The gist of my message was that although my, my mom had a lot of the characteristics portrayed in the reading, she wasn't perfect. She recognized her need for a savior and had accepted Jesus into her heart. I felt really compelled to introduce them to the book by Andy Stanley called How Good Is Good Enough. So I told them about how a few years prior to mom going into the nursing home, I had the opportunity to read it to her. For those of you who haven't had an opportunity to read it yet, the book addresses one of the most important questions a person could ever ask. What does it take to get into heaven? I shared with them that some people are under the misconception that they think that if they're really religious, that, that will get them into heaven. And others, that they're just not... Others think that they're too messed up, sorry, to get in, to be accepted into heaven, but that the book says neither of these really has anything to do with it. It's about having a relationship with Jesus Christ, and that it doesn't matter if we've been walking apart from God our whole lives. If we put our hope and trust in him, he will change what needs to change in our lives. That we don't need to be good enough or religious enough before asking for forgiveness. He accepts us right where we're at. I also shared with them that mom felt the book was thought-provoking and well-written and that I believe the book impacted her and changed her perspective on her relationship with God. I felt that my message would have more impact if I was able to provide copies of it, so I asked Rob if he, any, if he had any extra books. Rob was more than happy to supply me with, me with the 18 copies he had left, so I arranged to have them put at the back of the church before the service, and I'm happy to say that 16 of those 18 copies went that day. I may never know what, if any, impact I had on those who attended Mum's funeral, but I feel at peace knowing that I was obedient to his prompting, even though it was outside my comfort zone, just as speaking here in front of you today is. Thank you. What really is the problem with living a life centered around comfort? What is wrong with us just not wanting chaos and suffering in our life? You'd be kind of a crazy person, wouldn't you be, to want suffering and chaos in your life? We, we have enough of that. So we tend to focus much of our lives around of avoiding discomfort and avoiding suffering. And uh, what, what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is pretty simple. It, 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 it ignores the reality that there is suffering going on in this world. It, it, when I just pull off to my comfy little sofa chair and I'm nice and warm and, then, and, uh, you know, and I can shut the world out, and that's great, isn't it? The problem is it's not reality. Because just outside the walls of my house, there's suffering going. There are people who are suffering. There are people who are filled with sorrow, people who are lost, people who are just struggling through life, people who are alone. And, and when I focus on me just being comfortable, it just ignores that. And when I start pursuing comfort um, as, as a means of me just feeling at peace and, and fulfilled, well, it's, it's the wrong answer. It's the wrong solution. In fact, uh, me being comfortable is, is not going to be a solution at all. In fact, if we get back to that creation mandate that I use almost every week in Genesis 1, uh, 20, uh, 28, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. 
Well, what's God saying there? And he goes on, he says, um, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over everything that moves along the, on the earth. Why? Why have dominion? Why, why, why not just let things be as they are? And why not Adam and Eve just camp out in the garden? Because it was pretty nice there. Why move out of the garden into the rest of the world where it was just wild chaos? Now, it's beautiful. God created creation beautiful, but it was still chaos outside the garden. It wasn't managed. Why not just stay in the garden? Well, that wasn't what God's design for me or for you is. He designed that there'd be chaos out there. We leave the garden. We leave the place of comfort where everything's done for us. We leave that and we go into the world and we subdue the world. We take places of chaos and we bring God's order and peace and love into that environment. That is what you are made to do. You were equipped and designed to confront chaos, not to camp out in the comfort of the garden. Now, the garden's cool. It's a good place to return to. After you've had a little bit of day in the chaos, you want to return back to the garden to get recharged and restored, right? But that's not what our life focus is. And, and so it, it's kind of interesting that, that we were actually created to 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 front chaos to run towards it. And now with God in the garden and when before the fall of mankind, going into the chaos, that was kind of cool actually. Because you actually had authority and you had power because of God's spiritual presence in you and you could do things and you could say to that mountain be moved in the sea and it would happen. You could say weeds disappear and the weeds would disappear. We had that authority in Christ. Kind of mind boggling the type of authority Christ represented when he was on earth. He could calm the storm, right? It, it, it's kind of cool that, that we could have that ability to move into chaos and have influence. But after the fall, suddenly we have our own chaos. Not only is the chaos out there, the chaos is actually in here. And I've got enough of my own chaos, and man, that's exhausting. So man, after I deal with my own chaos, I, I just don't have enough energy to tackle the chaos out there. And so everyone becomes self-focused. It's about me. It's about what's going on in my life, first and foremost. And we stop thinking about the environment around us. We forget about the places where God has placed you. And, and you go into those places, your workplace or your family or your community, wherever it is, and you just go in, and you're just trying to survive. And you're guarding yourself from other people, and you're protecting, and you're trying to get significance. You're trying to get really. You're, you're doing all this stuff, and but again, it's 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 about my life. And we stop thinking about the environments that God has placed us in as places where we are sent to. To bring God's loving order and peace into the chaos. We just see it as places we're fighting against. And so God wants to start shifting our, our, our perspective. But, but since the fall, um, instead of running towards chaos, we run from it. And we, we build this little bubble of safety and comfort around ourselves. And we become actually so twisted in our thinking about this that we actually think that, that the person who wins the lottery and now has all that wealth, or the person that's got all the investments in place so they can retire and not work, and they can avoid the chaos, and they can just go on an eternal vacation <laughs> for the rest of their life. We tend to think that, that those people that have no concerns, that have everything taken care of, they have it the best. And we actually think, man, if I could just be like that, if I could just retire and just avoid the chaos, man, we would have it set. But you know, that is so twisted thinking from God's perspective. That's why God doesn't let us actually all win the lottery. That's why, like, when I had my, like, my investments going, I'd say, hey, God, you know, if you make my investments go, I'll give 20% of the investments back to you, and I'll reinvest the others so that more 20% can go back to you, and, and, and meanwhile, I'll just build up investment, and I can retire. And, and God just said, yeah, let's shut all those down. <laughs> Every single one of my investments tanked. I, and I mean tanked. <laughs> the businesses went completely out of business. So you never want me to invest in your company. <laughs> because God is just saying, Rob, I didn't create you 
to need money so that you could have control and relax and have the life of ease. I created you to engage in the chaos. So, so, but we have it in our minds that those that can just get to the top and have everyone do stuff for them, they can just sit back and just relax. God says, I didn't design you for that. I designed you to engage chaos and transform the environments that you enter into. Every enter, environment you enter into where it's a tangled weed of a mess. Go in and bring my love and my order and my peace into that place. Isn't it kind of interesting, even when he sent out the disciples... The, the, the 12, and they're to go into the towns. He said, when you go into those towns and someone takes you, brings you into their house, have your peace settle, or have my peace settle on that house. And they could actually do that. The apostles could say, may peace settle on this place. And the peace of God would settle on that household for as long as they were there. See, that's what God wants you to do. He wants you to go into environments where there's chaos. He just wants his peace to go with you and to transform whatever place he sends you into. He doesn't want you running from him. What would happen if we all ran from chaos? Where would that leave the world? And so, so it's kind of interesting that, that Jesus, as he looks at the world up in heaven, he looked at the world and he saw a world in, in chaos and in suffering. And Jesus could have played it safe. He could have stayed in heaven where it was comfortable but he chose to leave his throne, leave where he received glory, honor, and praise, and to take on human form and come down to earth. Listen to what it says, Philippians 2, 5 to 8. It says, you must have the same attitude that Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. See, Jesus left comfort and came down and entered into our chaos so that he could have bring God's peace and reign and truth and love into our lives to dispel the chaos and to dispel that suffering that we're experiencing in our souls. See, he left comfort. He didn't fight for comfort. It goes on in Isaiah 53 and describes what he went through. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Isn't that amazing that that was written 700 years before Christ went to the cross? Isn't that incredibly so specific, right? Every wording in there. But see, Jesus engaged in that. He knew he was going into that. He embraced that because as he looked at the chaos, he says, we need to dispel the chaos. And as he looks at your life, he says, there's chaos in your life. And I'm the answer. But he knew that he couldn't be the answer if he stayed on the throne. The only way Jesus could become the answer is if he left his comfort, and he came down and entered into your chaos, and he died in your place for your chaos, so that he could bring you peace. And isn't that interesting that that's the fruit of the Spirit that he wants to bring into our lives? Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, kindness, self-control, you know. He wants to bring all that into our life. That's, that's the presence of God entering into the chaos to bring peace. And that's what he, what he wants to do in your life, is what he wants to do through your life into every environment you walk into this week. And so instead of walking into an environment complaining about the environment, he wants you to walk into that environment because it's chaotic and there's, the character of God wants to enter into it and transform it through you. That's what he wants to do. But he can't do that if we're idolizing comfort. If comfort comes first and foremost in our life. You know, so Jesus saw the world suffering 
apart from him, so he entered into it to, to restore us back to him. And he entered the chaos to bring that loving order of God. And can you imagine if Jesus instead just to choose comfort over mission? If Jesus chose comfort over you, where that would leave life empty, unfulfilled, a little bit life lost. What am I doing with life? Where am I headed? Am I significant? Am I important? Do I count? If, if Christ stayed in heaven and he just leaves us where we're at, and then the future issue of judgment. And he does say there actually is a lake of fire. We're going to do a whole series on what happens after, after you die, after Easter, um, to de debunk all the myths of death and stuff. But, but Jesus says there is judgment and there is punishment. There is an accounting for how we live because he's just. And, and, and so Jesus says, you know what? I love you so much. I want to engage in your suffering. I'm going to suffer for you in ways that you've never even suffered. I'm going to suffer it for you so that I can bring peace into your life. And, and that's what he wants to do. And so um, Jesus knew that uh, people would be following him for all mixed emotion or, uh, motives. And, um, and, and so when he would be with his disciples, he would start, this is kind of interesting, we're just trying to get anyone we can to come to church. Jesus actually filtered out who, who followed after him. And, and because he knew that sometimes they would come with wrong motives and he wanted to clarify their motives because he wanted to make sure that there was no idols in their life. And, and so, for, as an example, in Matthew 8, 19, it says, Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. Yeah, that sounds cool. Jesus replied, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And what in the world is he saying there? He's obviously telling this teacher something that the teacher needed to hear to shake up his fantasy perspective of what it meant to follow Jesus. Obviously, the teacher somehow had in his mind that following Jesus would be a breeze, that following Jesus, everything would be rosy, that following Jesus, everything would be comfortable, and that with Jesus, uh, you, you, you'd get respect, and you'd get prestige, and you'd, you'd learn to become a teacher just like Jesus was, and, and get the crowds following him. And Jesus saying, you know what? If you're going to follow me, it's not going to be glorious. Not in the way that you're thinking anyways. Uh, he says, when I'm out on the road, I'm giving my life for people. I'm engaging in their discomfort. In fact, I, I don't even have a place to lay my head. I'll use that rock over there as a pillow. Uh, I was once camping, and we, we were canoeing to the lake. And as we were canoeing to the lake, we saw the storm coming behind us. And it was a wall. Have you you've ever seen that where just the wall is coming at you? And I said, paddle! Like there's, uh, there's, uh, I think we had two canoes, and we were just paddling, paddling to get to it. Well, we couldn't paddle fast enough. This wall just hit us. <laughs> And we still have to paddle to this island. We set up. It's now dark. We're setting up our tents. Everything's drenched. We're just sitting under a tent, a tarp. And we say, guys, we've got to get the tent set up. And, um, and so, because we just can't sit under a tarp all night. And so we get this tent set up in the dark, in the middle of the rain. And we set it up. And, in the, and, and we're, we're in there. And the tent's got puddles inside the tent. And um, I, fortunately, at least had a little tree stump in the middle of the tent that we didn't see. But it was just high enough I could use it as a pillow. <laughs> it wasn't an overly comfortable pillow. But nonetheless, that was the most comfort I had. The other guys would just lay over and their faces would be in a puddle. I had my little tree stump. Jesus had a rock. You know, it, whatever it is. <laughs> the issue is he doesn't invite us into comfort. He says, if you're going to follow me, I'm inviting you into a mission of suffering. Because you're going to engage in people's suffering. You're going to encounter people who are suffering. And you're coming in to transform that environment and to transform lives. And, and that's what it's all about. So Jesus filtered that out. I mean, that he did it with this teacher. Do you remember with the rich young man? He said, give up all your wealth. Give it to the poor. Come follow me. What is he? He's telling him to give up his idols of wealth and his idols of comfort, his idols of significance. He's telling this guy to give it all up. And in follow Jesus into a ministry and mission of chaos. He did it with Judas, essentially. I and mean, that's why Judas bailed. Judas discovered this following the Messiah thing wasn't quite going the direction he thought it was going to go. He thought that if he followed Jesus, the, the, the promised king, that he would be one of Jesus' right-hand men. And he'd get a position of power and significance. But Jesus just kept denouncing power and significance. And Jesus kept giving away wealth. Jesus kept 
ticking off the wrong people. And, and, and he, he wasn't grabbing hold of the throne even when people wanted to force it on him. He, he veered away from the throne. And what's going on here? And Jesus, Judas was thinking, this isn't what I signed up for. I signed up for power and significance, comfort and wealth. And man, I'm getting the complete opposite here. What is Jesus doing? Jesus wasn't pursuing those things. He was pursuing chaos, entering into people's lives to transform lives. And he invited people to join with him on that mission. He invited Judas on it. Judas bailed. Because Judas had either idols in this place. And so and it goes on. And, but it is kind of interesting um, that then Jesus passes that mission on to us in 2 Corinthians um, 5, 19. He says... For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sin against, sins against them, and he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation, so we are God's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us, for we speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. So, so Paul is saying that when you enter into a relationship with Christ, you can become an ambassador of reconciliation. Encouraging people to be restored back to relationship with God. So in order to be an ambassador of reconciliation, I have to keep entering into broken relationship. And wherever I see that people have broken relationship with God, he wants me to engage in them and to bring the peace and the love of God to them so they can discover who God is and experience life with God. And so, so instead of running from people, we're to run to people. And, and that's true on the horizontal level, on the vertical level, but we're supposed to live it out on the horizontal level with each other too, right? So whenever we see relational conflict, we are not to avoid relational conflict. Messengers of reconciliation, ambassadors of reconciliation, do not run from relational conflict. We run to relational conflict. Because we have a message of hope and peace in that relationship dynamic. And if we can work it out on the horizontal level, maybe people will start to grasp it on the vertical level in their relationship with God. Or if they get it in their relationship with God, we need to show them how to work it out on the horizontal level. But either way, we're running into relational conflict, relational chaos wherever we go. And we're supposed to. We're not supposed to run away from conflict. We're supposed to bring the love and the peace of God into it. And, and that's what he wants us to do. You know, um, when we start doing this, though, you've got to understand that not everyone's going to respect you for wanting to transform the environment. Uh, some people will feel threatened by that. And, and even though we want to do it in loving, tactful ways, and we just want people to see the love of Christ through us. But uh, you've got to understand that uh, sometimes that, that suff there's going to be suffering that comes into play with that. Um, and uh, listen to what it says in Romans 5, 3 to 5. It says, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. We know that they can help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and, strength, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead us to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us his Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. And, and, and so what he's saying is, as you go into the conflict, God's not just going to work through you to transform the environment. He's going to work in you to transform you too. If you avoid conflict, if you avoid the chaos, you are removing the opportunity for God to work in your life. Man, the times I've had to deal with relational conflict have been some of the most transforming times in my life. The times when I've hit areas of chaos and struggle have been the most transforming times in my life. And that's true for you too. You haven't grown when everything's gone smoothly. You've only grown when you've entered into situations where you've had to been stretched and you've, you've had to approach things differently. You had to change. And God uses those environments to change you and to transform you. And so, so even though suffering was never part of God's original plan intent, God's going to take the suffering that's in this world. And if we stay in proper relationship with him, as we enter into suffering, as we experience suffering, God's going to use that suffering to transform us into what he wants us to be as kingdom influencers. 
as people who have been transformed in the midst of suffering can now enter into suffering and help transform the environment in people's lives. And that's what he wants to do. He says in 2 Timothy uh, 3, Paul writes, You know how much persecution and suffering I've endured. You know all about how I was persecuted in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, but the Lord rescued me from it all. Yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil people and imposters will flourish, and they will deceive others and will themselves be deceived. See, when you start representing Christ in a sin-corrupted world, <laughs> the chaos is going to fight back. And that's okay. Because your life is in Christ if you've embraced Christ. And you've got that hope of salvation in you. You've got the hope of the presence of God that whatever happens to you, doesn't matter. Your life is already taken care of eternally. It doesn't matter. You, God can send you wherever he wants to send you. You don't have to protect anything. You don't have to defend anything because your life is in his hands. It's only if your life is in his hands that you have to start guarding and protecting and defending. You know. But see, when, when your life is given to him and he, he can do whatever he wants with it, guess where he's going to send you, guys? He's going to send you into the chaos to transform it. Because that was our creation mandate. So, you know, there's uh, areas of chaos in our lives right now. I'm, I know there is. Because God's placed you there. And sometimes we, because we have a twisted perspective, we start to complain to God about the chaos. We say, God, why did you allow me to have this experience? Why did you let that happen? Why is this going on? And God says, you really don't get it, do you? First of all, they're suffering in this world because you guys collectively, as humankind, embraced suffering through sin in your life, and your sin is bringing suffering. The suffering in this world is never my doing. That's all you're doing. So, first of all, this is all your fault. <laughs> so he says. But he says, despite the fact that you guys created the suffering in this world, I will, through you, engage in that suffering to transform and bring my peace and presence. So, don't complain about the suffering and the chaos that you find yourselves in, God's saying, it's there just because it's there in this world. But I have placed you in that location, in that job, in that family, in that community. I've placed you there because you are to fill the earth and subdue it and bring my loving order, my, the fruit of my spirit, into each of those places. Through you, lives should be transformed in each of these areas you're in. Stop complaining about the chaos and be the solution to the chaos. Adam and Eve, as they left the garden, encountered a, a tangled mess, weren't supposed to whine and complain about it. They go, wow, look at the opportunity to bring God's peace into the chaos. And it would have been a joy to them. It would have been a thrill, especially as the Spirit of God worked powerfully through them to transform creation. Well, God still wants to do that through you. We gotta stop whining and complaining We've got to stop grumbling about our circumstances. We either want to have to realize God's doing something through the circumstance to transform changes, or he's sending us into it to transform that environment, to bring his love, joy, and peace to the people in those situations. We are the church, the hope of the world. If we do not have that relationship with Christ, well then, we're just struggling with our chaos, and it's going to be an unending struggle. But in Christ, he gives us the hope to raise us up above the chaos, so that we can have influence and control and power of influence in there to transform lives, to bring peace where there is no peace, to bring joy where there's no joy, order where there's no order. So this week, is there something you need to do? Have you been looking at situations wrong? Relationships wrong? Your job wrong? Have you been looking at things wrong? because you've been seeing them from a comfort, idolistic perspective? Or are you looking at the chaos and saying, man, God sent me here because I've got a role to play. He wants to do something in me. He wants to do something through me, through this environment that he's placed me in. So I'm going to be faithful, and I'm going to bring the character of Christ into that environment and pray for a transforming work to happen there. And you start to see how he does that. You know, with these idols, 
we all sort of fall away at times and we get struggled and sometimes it's um, how do we change how, how do we how do we get rid of these controlling idols in our life and I just want to read to you this passage what Jesus says that when you start to probe into an area of sin because that sin area has become an idol to you listen to what he says in Matthew 5 29 so if your eye even your good eye causes you to lust gouge it out throw it away it's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into Hades or hell um, actually sorry it's not Hades it would be Gehenna uh, hell actually isn't a, uh, it's not in the Greek. Gehenna is a place that was just outside Jerusalem. It was the garbage dump, essentially. Uh, it was a place where it, um, sometimes they offered their babies and sacrificed to the god Molech. But it then eventually became a, a, just a garbage dump where they'd throw dead animal carcasses and, and excrement and all the stuff. It was just this burning dung heap, basically, that was forever on fire. And it became a picture of future judgment. So that's the place that he's, he's talking about here. Um, it's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into Gehenna. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you sin, cut it off, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into Gehenna. And, and what he's saying here, guys, is uh, obviously it's not a literal solution. Cutting off your, cut, gouging out your eye doesn't cause you to stop lusting. But what he's saying is, if there's something that's prompting you to fall into sin, deal with it. Cut it out. Get rid of it. It's like a cancer. You need to cut the cancer out and get, throw it out. You don't want to leave a little bit of the cancer there. You want to cut it out. Um, I remember dealing with, a, a, in another city, uh, a family, and, and the youth, uh, the little the boy, uh, just early teens, struggled uh, with two things. He struggled with violent video games and pornography. And guess where he accessed both of those things from? It was through the internet. And I strongly suggested to the parents, cut off your internet. Or at least change so he doesn't have internet access. Like, rescue this kid from himself. But for various reasons, the parents never did that. And guess how the boy did? Never broke free. Just grows, grows, and grows. And th that would have been an example of saying, man, if that's, a, if that's a, 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 an avenue of sin that's going to put your child into bondage, get rid of it. I don't care how convenient emails are, and I don't care about that sort of like if, it, if it's causing it, then deal with it. Cut it out. It's better that, that he lose internet access than his soul deteriorate like it's deteriorating. Help them, like, and come along and support them. And, and, and it's, as a church, we're not to judge each other on these. We're, we're here to support and to help each other. And if you struggle in an area, then part of the way of cutting it off is cutting off the secrecy and getting the support you need. Get the help you need. Cut off whatever is hindering you from moving forward in a healthy, righteous direction that's going to bring freedom and peace and joy in your life and cut out shame and, and, and destruction. Uh, but you can't do that by yourself usually. But there are some things you just need to get rid of, saying that's no longer part of my life. Uh, certain types of TV shows or certain types of movies, or certain types of books, certain types of websites, certain types of relationships, certain types of things. We just need to sever them because they are destroying our soul and our walk with God, hindering us from experiencing the peace. Not because it's a judgmental thing we're looking down at. We don't care about judgment. We care about experiencing the joy, peace-filled life that God wants to have with you and through you. And we all struggle with this. So we're supposed to be a community of support and help, not judgment. It's a community of, of coming alongside each other to help each other move forward in healthy directions. And I love, I just want to close with this passage in Deuteronomy 4.27, because I love this, because Israel under Moses has come up to the, um, to the Jordan River, the second time. They did it 40 years earlier when Israel rebelled and saying, we can't go in, we can't go in. And, and, and they 
revolt and they want to head back to Egypt. And so God makes them travel in the wilderness for 40 years as a result till all those adult males died and a new generation's come along. Now that second generation's, generation's come along, Moses is now reviewing the covenant terms, the, the Ten Commandments and the whole law with them, and, and renewing their covenant relationship with God just before they cross now into the promised land. And it, but through that, God speaks to the Israelites and saying, there's going to come a time when you are going to turn your backs on me. And you're going to start chasing wrong directions. You're going to start chasing false idols. And it's going to bring emptiness and misery and sorrow and suffering into your life. But even when you've done that and you've turned away from me and you've been kicked out of the land and you've been pushed off the land because of your disobedience, listen to what he says. Verse 27, the Lord will scatter you among the nations and only a few of you will survive among the nations to which the Lord will drive you. There you will worship man-made gods of wood and stone which cannot see or hear or eat or smell. But, and I love this but. So, so picture where they come. They've been kicked off the land because of their sinful disobedience to God and chasing other idols, false idols. And God's exiled them. And they're still worshiping idols in that other land. But he says, but even if from there, no matter how far they've moved away from him, no matter how much they've resisted him and fought him, no matter where they're at in their disobedience, he said, but if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you look for him with all your heart and with all your soul. God is inviting us to evaluate life, to evaluate what we've been chasing after, thinking that would just give me life. If I could just get that, it would give me life. If I could just get that, it would give me life. If I could have that relationship, that job, that bank account, that whatever it is, if I could just have that, I would be happier. And God's saying, that's an idol. Stop chasing idols. And when you find that you've chased idols and they've brought nothing into your life, you're still no more fulfilled today than you were a year ago. Then he says, from that point in your life, if you will stop and turn back and seek me first in your life, you will find me. And I will be there for you. Because this is a God of mercy, a God of grace, a God of love, who wants to accept you back to himself. And once he's brought you back to himself, he then wants to send you out into the chaos. So, this week, enjoy your chaos. Enjoy your chaos. Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Consider it pure joy. Why? Because you now have a purpose to fulfill with Jesus Christ. And the two of you working together in that, it's going to produce amazing things. So, enjoy the chaos. Let's pray. Father, as we uh, finish this series on idol worship, it's still sometimes hard for us to see the idols in our lives, but I pray that you'd make them clear to us even this week. Would you point out the things that we wrongly chase after to give us a sense of life and me? Would your spirit actually do that? Would you convict us saying, that's emptiness, that's meaningless, that gives nothing? Would you help us start, start seeing things through your eyes and not the faulty perspective we have about life? And Lord, would your spirit convict us to turn to you to be the solution for life, the fulfillment of life, and to find meaning and purpose in you? And then would you send us out with power and influence into, these, into the chaos so that we could be transformed, but also that you could transform other people's lives through us? And I just pray, Father, that you would do that cool work and that we would see your kingdom grow as a result. In Jesus' name we pray.